Welcome to Duality Check, the podcast where two brothers embark on a journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the mysteries of the past, and the uncharted frontiers of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together, we'll unravel the tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder. Get ready to question, ponder, and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on Duality Check. I'm Drew. And I'm Dean, and welcome to episode 43. Boom, boom. For us, it's just a day later. We're trying to get ahead of schedule, get some pre-recording done here. Yeah. So we're going to continue on with this uh, Lou Elizondo book. Yeah. But before that, we got our, we'll do a, it'll be our weekly dose of Bashar, but really daily. But, <laughs> For uh, us, yeah. All right, cool. Let's check out what. Uh, so this is Bashar's insane prediction for 2025 and beyond with when it comes to encounters. Oh, interesting. All right. Let's, uh, yeah. let's check this out. Cool. Let's try it again with <laughs> unmuted audio. Contact between your world and other worlds will generally begin in the window of 2025 to 2033, stretching to 2040, and definitely be very active by 2050. That's the window that exists as we read the energy now. That's the highest probability. It will begin slowly, sparse contacts here and there in remote places, but it will begin to build. And eventually, sometime within that window before 2040, you will find that there will start to be sanctuaries on your planet where hybrid children will begin to live so they can acclimate to your society and allow your society to acclimate to them so that they can learn to live among you and you among them and eventually in the blending between your species, allowing Earth to evolve into the sixth hybrid race. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> one more question, um, more about when will we occupy Mars? When will you occupy it? Yeah, us humans. You mean when will any human set foot on Yes, any humans. I mean, I'd like to too, but I mean... Generally speaking, most likely, certainly before 2035. Wow. It could happen sooner, but that seems to be the outside window. Wow, thank you so much. Well, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> thank you, Bashar. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Open contact. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Yeah, so that's his uh, predictions. If, I don't know if you'd call it a prediction if you already knew the information, right? If you believe it. Yeah. I mean... But he makes it sound like if they, you know, as if they're like reading some sort of energy. So like, like there's some sort of information, like tr go, traveling. Like imagine... Yeah, it's pretty nebulous uh, as far yeah. as the prediction goes. So there's not a lot of oh yeah, it's not, not a lot to grab idea. onto there. Yeah, um, it does sort of his prediction does sort of start with the time window that like Chris Bledsoe talks about. Uh, well, the lady and the, the lady. Whole mm -hmm. Red Star Regulus thing. Um, yeah, well, they said 2026, right? Uh, I thought that was this is 2025. Was that maybe it was 2025? Yeah. Anyway, it was like uh, uh, Easter on Easter, mm. right? Uh, yeah, I thought there was like a couple windows, but yeah, probably. I forget. We we had talked about this, and I kind of like dove into it and looked something up, and, I, and then I don't remember what I did. Found. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because we, we didn't bring it up again, apparently. <laughs> no, we did. I just, uh, just because I knew it at one point doesn't mean I, I will forget. Held on to it, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so that was our weekly dose with Shire. Interesting. I mean, the idea of like settling a bunch of hybrids here for us to interact with is a weird thing. Too, especially when you consider like the experiences that 
a lot of the ab- abductees go through in the quote unquote generation of those hybrids, it's not always pleasant for them. Right. And it's dubious as to how consensual it is, right? Like, I have a hard time uh, grappling with the morality of it on their end. It seems pretty clear cut from like a human morality perspective that these people are taken against their will. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, in some, in most cases, at least, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of times, like when people will be like regress back or whatever to to talk about or to remembering their experiences. Um, there. I, I mean, I remember some indications of like conversations where they're like, "Oh yeah, no, that, like you, you give us permission to do this, or essentially." Yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. Is that but like at some deep level, you've given permission for this at, in like a past life or like a spirit form or something? But like, still, the experience you're having as a human. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. It's well, and you don't remember something that you it. Wouldn't remember you're exactly. Full of so fear. It's like, like it seems, unless that's part of the, the it reason just, they're doing it in the first place. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't hold up to our standards of of informed consent, right? Right. right. Like uh, in contract law and whatnot. Like right. there has to be a meeting of the minds. Like you can't be tricking someone. You can't be. Um, they can't be under some sort of influence. Like they have to be, it has to be seen as a meeting of the minds in order for like some sort of agreement to be seen as legally valid. Unless that did happen behind the scenes by somebody, <clears throat> some group of humans. No, right? but it, but what if there some, was, uh, some random human can't give consent, consent for on, everybody on my behalf or well, on someone else's behalf. I mean, I mean they can try yes, to, but that's. But at the same time, if they realize that you're powerless to stop them sure sure they, i'm not saying can, there aren't agreements in, between three right, parties what I mean, but yeah. what i'm saying is like from a like a personal ethics like mm-hmm. yeah this is it's pretty um in the red red area yeah well <laughs> it's not like if you personally are not giving consent over your own body and then you're being abducted and made part of some hybridization program then Regardless of whether some president or some CIA director or some black suit or even you in spirit form before you incarnated, if you in your current facility knowingly as a human being did not consent to this, like, then that's yeah. that's kidnapping and that's assault and that's, you know. I mean, and so, if- like, if you're going to take the product of that which is all these hybrid children and then bring them back, drop them on earth. Like there's like a lot of weird moral conundrums that need to be dealt with there. Yeah. If you, you would, you would assume that if they were, if they were telling the truth about us being, having given consent or whatever, then why wouldn't we also be given the respect of like being able to just know the truth of it all and like have access to our, like be taught Mm -hmm. how to have access to that spirit world so you can confirm that with your own self, right? And be given the knowledge you need to be okay with something like this happening, knowing what is actually happening, all that. Like, otherwise it seems pretty nefarious to, to have that information, not share it with us, and then claim that you, without giving any sort of, evidence to make you feel confident in that so yeah mm-hmm. it would be it's definitely would be is considered nefarious even even the people who claim to have be like oh yeah like i'm okay with it maybe they're okay with it now but maybe there was a time when they were uncomfortable with it right yeah if they're a, like one of these like multiple abductee types or whatever so either they have a different standard of morality or they don't give a shit about Mm -hmm. our like morality and like rights. Um, which if they don't give a shit, that's a red flag. 
if they have a different standard, then they need to be more fucking open about that shit. Mm -hmm. um, In another video, Bashar does talk about the different types of humanoid beings mm -hmm. that inhabit, like the local solar system, basically. And he says there's millions of them, but that most of them aren't physical in, in form. Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. don't have a physical human-like body or humanoid type body. But there are a lot of them that do. And he says we're only, he said that we're only actually in contact or have ever been in contact with a small fraction of what it is that are like us. So the humanoid types that we would recognize as potentially being intelligent just based off of their physical features. And that one of them he considered was the was the lizard people. He mm. didn't consider he didn't fully consider them humanoid. Oh even though they had arms, legs and a you know um head where everything's balanced left and right on you know the hemispheres of the body and all. anyway. Yeah. It's I interesting. wonder like what classification methods he's using for that. Like maybe it's some sort of mental faculty or moral maybe. faculty. Maybe <clears throat> but he also does talk about like that you have some sort of deep agreement with what it is that you're here to seek and that the experience of human is only one and it's one that like not many souls choose mm -hmm. and if that's true then like he's from a place where they have this knowledge of what it is to die and reincarnate and come back and have that like experience of choice outside of physical form then that's I mean obviously if you believe in the channel and you believe that he, if this is actually being named Bashar like that's pretty that's pretty uh, I don't know cryptic and like I would you would hope for more right like if you're actually in, like having a conversation with a being you'd hope for like be like them to be like this is the plan this is what we do and this is how we do it I mean, he does, in in a sense, over time, like talk about all the different ways to just like f achieve your your higher self. But I don't know. I, I guess it's better that it's not turning into like a religion, even though I'm sure there are fanatics for him. Oh, I mean, it's turning into cults all over the place. But yeah, and it has throughout time. But that's true. Yeah, we talked about the uh, in the, religions that one lady, that one cult leader, that um believed so much that she was like Jesus and all of these, like mm -hmm, she was channeling mm -hmm. all of these different famous people. And then it got to a point where she stopped believing in it, but she, her followers believed so strongly that, and they were able to persuade her by giving her drugs and making basically it was like eat. a, it was like a reverse yeah. cult yeah. where the cult leader ended up being wa wanting out. But the the held followers held, the followers. held her hostage so yeah. that they could continue to worship her. It's insane. That's crazy stuff, dude. <laughs> All, All right, right. You want to well, dive in here? Yeah, let's dive in. And so we're on chapter four. This is called The Secrets Within. Um, so we'll start here at the beginning. He, he sort of covers, um, he's used this word skiff before, and I'm sure you've heard it a mm -hmm. lot. I don't know if you know exactly what that means. Um, but he sort of explains it here in this uh, paragraph, this first paragraph. So I figure this is useful to cover. So the new job at OSAP slash ATIP was like one of those Russian dolls, one tiny secret tucked within another. Soon after I started working with them, Jay and Jim began briefing me on the program in a skiff. That's short for Sensitive Compartmented Information Facility. These are bland conference rooms that resemble acoustically tricked out shipping containers. They block sound and radio and electromagnetic waves. Some of you have, uh, some, sometimes you have white noise machines to further drown out any opportunity for someone to eavesdrop on you. When you enter a skiff, you discuss top secret matters. You show your credentials, relinquish your cell phone, and don't utter a, a word until someone ensures everyone um, is appropriately cleared and closes the vault-like door from the inside. So 
Yeah, I've heard people talk about skiffs and stuff. Especially like in Congress lately, they talk about wanting to get access to skiffs so that they can be read in on a lot of the top secret information. Right. And I sort of... That's kind of where I... I understood those were like meetings where like secret top, conversations yeah. had, but I didn't realize like... How... What, what it actually entailed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these are like no joke... Hmm. Um, sort of isolation rooms. Do a little Wikipedia search with your highlight there. That's cool. Yeah, and it sort of froze my mouse. So oh, shit. That's great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there it goes. All right. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, he talks about how OSAP was uh, primarily focused on UAP, but they also spent a, a decent amount of their work looking into the Skinwalker Ranch, okay. being that Bob Bigelow was one of their outside contractors that they worked with, and he had purchased Skinwalker Ranch. Around the time that Lou was getting in, in there? He owned it at the time that yeah, oh, okay. Lou was part of OSAP, a tip. So was he ever on one of those shows? He was, wasn't he? Lou Elizondo? Maybe I, not. I don't know. Anyway, probably not. I don't know. I'm sure when they were doing their f actual research, they were probably doing it, but, you know, not in broad daylight. <laughs> um, I've, I've been looking... I don't know where in the book he says who this Jay character is, but um, he says Jay coined the term the hitchhiker effect... Um, to describe the phenomenon of the strange activity at Skinwalker following a person home. Oh, yeah. And continuing to harass them. Um, they were looking into Skinwalker because they, uh, they thought that the, that the science warranted it and they needed to explore the possibility that it was connected to UAP because there right. were a lot of sightings. Yeah, because it's so there. strange. Yeah. yeah, there's so many weird things. So if some of those strange phenomena are connected to UAPs, you as the government entity trying to investigate these things kind of makes sense to be. Yeah, you'd want to try to connect the dots. Yeah. Later on, he explains that as they transition from OSAP to ATIP, that um, ATIP didn't really focus on Skinwalker, but OSAP did. Okay. Um, and he thinks that it was part of the association with like Skinwalker that ultimately became the reason why they made some like internal enemies that wanted the program shut down because it was a little too weird. I assume. It was attracting the wrong kind of attention for whoever was running the program. Or right, right. Um, so this is the part <clears throat> where um, Lou starts uh, doing searches through the government databases. His job now is to get up to speed. Right, right after he had been up. in that last um, that dinner meeting, was there somebody in his position before? Um, That's so something I don't. I wanted to. His specialty was doing um, counterintelligence security, right? So he would come into a program and he would lock it down against other spy agencies and shit. That was okay. like his particular specialty. Okay, and they brought him to provide. That service that for level the program. Of security for him. Yeah. So, but um, in doing so, he needed to know enough to know what people would be searching for, how how they would come yeah. at them. What I mean, they were bringing him in as part of the team for investigation purposes and stuff too. But yeah, like, but that was because like his, he had that skill set of being able to might as well do, do, that do that counterintelligence too. lockdown work. That was why one of the reasons that probably plus his like remote viewing training and stuff like right, that. Of course. But, and his just general like you would I believe he was probably more open minded than he lets on that he was maybe because he was always told not to or just he never let it in. But I feel like he always had an idea that there was more and that Yeah, so it depends on how you define open minded, right? Because the mm -hmm. way he describes it he, Jesus, <laughs> the way he describes it, um, he, uh, he didn't really have a opinion one way or the other. 
So he wasn't right. closed minded. Like he didn't he actively it. think it was BS, but he also wasn't one of these people who like was always Spend watching all sci-fi. This time looking and, like, looking at it. Yeah, okay. Right. So that's right. Okay. So that answers that. That's a way of being open minded, you know. Sure. Like and then that between between that and his remote viewing experience, I'm sure he must have been somewhat more open minded about the nature of the world and what was real and what wasn't, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so at Jim's suggestion, I use my government computer to search terms, including unknown technology, unusual performance, anomaly, unidentified, UFO, UAP, the word lights plus sky yielded good results. The terms unidentified plus radar were also good for digging up incidents that were not flagged by their original writers as UAP incidents. Mm. I was dumbfounded by how many compelling resorts reports resided on top secret servers that I had access to. However, I was also aware um, um, of which hot words could get you into trouble. Hot words could alert other individuals that you were poking your nose into areas for which you lacked clearance. This would trigger an extensive investigation into your activities to determine whether you had a need to know or were trying to get information about someone else's program. Mm. I also made it a point to learn as much as I could from our outside scientific consultants. In the Pentagon, we referred to senior or emeritus staffers as graybeards, <laughs> keepers of knowledge, wise retainers of sensitive information <laughs> that was never written into any reports. I could sift through reports till doomsday, but I owed it to myself to lock down in a skiff and get the lay of the land from these graybeards over a cup of coffee. The list of in-program graybeards was short. There was a man I'll refer to as William, Will Livingston. I believe. You'll refer to him, but then you give us his little full name. <laughs> Bill Livingston sounds like a name I've heard in these circles before, but maybe I'm just. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, for years he presided over their little known weird desk at the CIA. The X Files. Yeah, basically. In charge of <laughs> investig yeah, exactly. In charge of investigating unusual medical issues, implants and abductions, all related to UAP encounters and anything strange. It was the real X Files of the CIA. I got ahead of us. <laughs> He was the keeper of all those secrets. Will is a patriot of the American cause, passionate about his work and pursuing truth. A medical doctor and a surgeon based out of Detroit, Will was part of every program that was too sensitive to be publicly acknowledged, hence his involvement. So yeah, he seems like a sort of a scully character being a medical doctor. Yeah. Into the... Yeah. Huh. Into all those, yeah, as part of the CIA, though. Right. They so, were part of the FBI at x Right. right. Well, yeah, I mean, you would have access to even more information around the world, probably. Yeah. I'd be having been worked for the CIA instead of just being domestic stuff. Mm hmm At the time we met, he was in his 60s and had seen the best and worst of government bureaucracy, and it showed. He came across as a curmudgeonly grandfather, <laughs> jaded and frustrated by a system he had spent so many years defending and supporting. Will had little patience for incompetence, but he was also exceedingly kind and patient if you were willing to learn. Um, when we first connected, I told him how the Colares Brazil case shocked me, I had assumed that if UAP were indeed real, they zipped in and out of our atmosphere harmlessly. I didn't know that they could harm or kill people. It just never occurred to me that there could be biological effects, I said. Will hinted that I was in for a rude awakening. UAP aside, any technology that could compare, <laughs> any technology that can perform like that, he said, something for which we have no explanation of how it works, why would you presume there wouldn't be any negative biological consequences if you fool around with it? 
Good point. I thought to myself. Yeah. That is a good point. That is. Yeah, and it's kind of a backwards way. It kind of makes you think, like, is it, is it like in some way equivalent to like you don't want to be standing too close to a rocket when it goes off? Right. Or behind or in front of a jet turbine? Yeah. Right? Like uh, maybe there are sort of uh, dangers to being too, too close to these craft. Yeah. I'm sure whatever it is, it is that they're using or doing is can it just inherently makes sense <laughs> but also in the case of Colares it sounds a lot like uh, um, some of the biological effects they had on people were done through the like abductions right yeah it did seem like the not majority just, like, of them, nearby experiences not just something you, you were just mind your own business and nothing happened other than you got hit in the chest by some laser or something mm-hmm yeah. Um, yeah. Which still makes sense, though, because it, I don't know, doesn't, obviously, whatever it is that they're using <laughs> to get you in could just harm you, just whatever yeah. it is, even if they're already going to harm you, but just whatever it is, tractor beam that it is, the net and hook. Right. Maybe right. that has its own effects, just them using that on you. Yeah. But then it makes you question people who have, like, healing experiences, like Bledsoe and stuff. Well, you know. But it from, all may not be the same technology I, or, or species the same be- either. Exactly. Same beings even. So, yeah, that, may, that w- it would make sense that they would have different intentions and different ways of doing things and mm-hmm. and some may not be really UAP like these orbs or whatever could just could actually be the beings themselves right. and they're able to just travel through space time dimensions whatever and they kind of come and go and they have some it's seemingly like large scale knowledge of whatever's going whatever's happening whatever like macro changes are happening in the universe and they have effects that go that trickle down just like waves you know mm. so the physical re- physical world would could be just as affected by non-physical stuff going on i just think it's cool <coughs> that there's a real life uh, x-files type character <laughs> out there that was in the government <laughs> yeah he kind of sounds like a mixture between um scully and who was their boss skinner skinner yeah yeah it kind of sounds like a mixture of them all right cool we're close to a break why don't we take that and then we'll okay. come back and we'll talk about the next gray beard that he gets down in the skiff maybe this is molder <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is Stevie Nader, Hurt No More. I'll try to rub this pink rectangle Over lines of time is scribbled But life can get so tangled And the soul can be quite brittle, yeah So burdened by history Love burned alive instantly
a stern conviction Of eyes and mouth and lips and breath Of whispered repetition So burdened by history Love burned alive instantly You don't wanna hurt no more You don't, you don't wanna hurt Cool. Let's keep going. Okay. So uh, I also spent as much time as possible with Hal Putoff. I was, it wasn't until much later that I met Eric Davis, an astrophysicist with high-level national security clearances who also worked with Hal as a contractor for the program. Eric's reputation was well known in the IC. Uh, the intelligence Inter- community. The intelligence community, I believe, yeah. And I um, was told that he was even provided, he even provided the presidential daily briefing. Eric has long consulted with a number of aerospace and defense contractors, including the one founded by Hal, EarthTech. Younger than Hal, the mustached, spectacled Davis was known to wear Hawaiian shirts in settings where others sported dress suits. I learned he began, I learned and began to appreciate that Eric was never afraid to be who he was, a genius maverick. He rejected political gamesmanship, and with him, what you see is what you get. Over time, he would become my trusted friend. I considered Eric one of the great living researchers of the most honest, and one of the most honest men I've ever known. He has an idea that is photographic memory and remembers details beyond normal human capabilities. He was also an, an excellent intelligence officer, good at ferreting out secrets that have been hidden in the UAP world. In recent years, he's become known as the U, in UAP circles as the alleged author of the legendary Wilson Davis memo. Mm. The story goes that in the late 1990s, Eric met and chatted up Vice Admiral Thomas R. Wilson, who was Director of Intelligence, J2, for the Joint Staff. After their conversation, Eric wrote up a 13-page summary of their talk, which he confidentially shared with a small group of like-minded UAP-interested colleagues and officials. Hal and Eric gave a copy of this memo to Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the famous American astronaut who was part of the Apollo 14 mission and a close friend and confidant of Hal and Eric. The sixth person to walk on the moon, Mitchell was a naval aviator, an engineer trained in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and a Presidential Medal of Freedom honoree. He was longtime champion of the UAP topic due to his childhood Growing up on a ranch in the Roswell, New Mexico area, um, 
and what he had since learned as an astronaut. Once he confided to Hal and Eric that his family was among the, Ros the Roswell families who were threatened by the FBI after the famous Roswell crashes. FBI agents visited ranchers in the region going door to door t to deliver threatening message. If you speak about the crashes, you will be killed. Plain and simple. Damn. Right? Holy shit. I didn't know that about Edgar, Edgar Mitchell. Mm-mm. I didn't know that he had had that yeah. upbringing. Wow. Just like UFOs and crazy stuff. Is he sounds life. like the Molder. Right. He sounds like the Mulder character that had this childhood experience and mm -hmm. then found himself in the intelligence communities. And All we're missing is his sister being kidnapped 20 years ago. I mean, shoot, you might as well. Maybe he's keeping that secret or too. Abducted. Yeah. Maybe he's keeping that secret too because Maybe. he can't talk about it. <laughs> so when Mitchell died, his safe was opened and the memo was found and circulated publicly by his estate. That is how the memo leaked. Um, the Wilson Davis memo created a sensation for good reason. You know, before we go into this, I actually have the Wilson Davis memo, so I was thinking we you could read actually it? read it. I'm down. Let's insert that here. Yeah. This is the whole thing? This is the whole thing. Yep. All... Okay. Well, mine is 15 oh, pages. Okay, yeah. I thought it was just the one page. I'm no, thinking. no. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Sick. So, so these are just notes. Um, this is dated, this titled EWD Notes. So, Eric, whatever his middle name is, Davis. Eric Wilson. Wilson. Yeah, no, I, th yeah. I don't know. Wilson is the admiral. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, dated 10-16-2002, Eric Davis meeting with Admiral Wilson. Rich says to go to EG&G Special Projects building at Greer and Paradise. Meet at 10 a.m. Don't be late. 10-10. Admittedly late. <laughs> Arrives with two Navy officers in uniform. He's in suit. Now civilian in uniform. One full lieutenant, one commander, one, and a petty officer drives car. Greetings with Admiral Wilson. We sit in his car and back at EG and G building, talk until eleven eleven twenty a.m. Others departed to for building to attend meeting inside at ten ten. Um. So. I believe TW is, yeah, Thomas Wilson. So I'll just say Wilson for those, and then I'll say Davis for yep. the others. So Wilson, hello. The minute I saw your resume, um, U.S. Uniform Services ID copy, Air Force orders in the physics paper Rich gave, I knew who you were. Put two and two together, figured you out, figured who you were, laughs. You don't want to talk about my career or DIA history. E -dub, or Davis. No, <laughs> actually not. <laughs> Wilson. I recalled a phone call with Oak Shannon in fall, August 99. Big Oak Shannon fan. Go back years in Navy before Oak left for Langley. I think that's what that is. Um, Oak talked two hours, wanted to convinced to talk to me basically was trying to convince uh wilson to talk to eric davis about yeah. what he told will miller in june 97 you know and, what i noticed real quick before go we go any further because i, I want to get this out why do they why the phonetics of it is so off so the reason is because this is uh, Eric Davis's notes of their meeting right afterward, right? So it's not like the whole thing was recorded. They had a meeting, and then he basically had to sit down afterwards and like jot together like everything they just had said. Yeah, so I this feel are like his the notes would be a little bit meeting. better, but it's well, still, it's like it, shorthand. So the, maybe maybe he had a, like a a notepad and was like doing shorthand jotting yeah, as he, yeah. that's kind of my take on it. But I've, I've seen it this way before. Mm -hmm. Like when you read these type of memos, even, I mean, this is only an O2, but like further back, like a similar kind of cadence to these things. 
And the only thing I can think of, because even you started to do it, you start to paraphrase. Yeah. It like forces you to paraphrase because you, it, it like just hearing it, it made me like, it was like, okay, it's like the phonetics is off. So it's hard to like read verbatim. Right. Right. And then you start paraphrasing and right. that, I don't know why, but it, that just caught my attention. By the way, if you're interested, go to our website or we'll leave a link in the YouTube video or on the podcast show notes uh, you, to actually download the memo. Um, I'll leave it there linked for you guys to download. Yeah, read it out loud to yourself and tell me <laughs> you don't notice the same thing. It's a PDF. It's only 15 pages here, so it's not a lot to go through. So if our reading of it is hard to stand here, you can go over it yourself. I, we'll probably end but up But there's a lot of interesting details in this. That, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So Oak talked two hours, wanted to convince, to talk to me, EWD, about what he told Will Miller, CA June 97 and April 97. So I imagine that's two different meetings he's referring to there. Uh, RE Boston Globe story, L. Keene. That's uh, Leslie Keene's Boston Globe story, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yep, UFO talk it. Yep, UFO topic. Crashed slash retrieved UFO slash craft bodies, ETC, MJ-12, like UFO organization or cabal. Davis, what was said? Wilson, confirmed Greer, Miller, Mitchell gave talk in Pentagon conference room. Admiral Mike Crawford, General Pat Hughes, Hughes is his boss, were present, others to Hughes says Hughes his boss, so I think Hughes being Wilson's boss or Crawford. Ma yeah, because Admiral, General. I think General would go. I think above. so. Pretty sure. I don't know how that works. Um, we're present. Others too. Date April ninety seven. Edgar Mitchell said April 9th, ninety seven. After group broke up, Miller Wilson talked privately two hours on. UFOs, MJ-12, Roswell, crashed UFOs, alien bodies, um, TW intrigued, knew about intelligence on U.S. military intel, UFO co close encounters, and foreign government encounters, seen records, told Miller. Um, Wilson, yes, Miller, asked the question on MJ-12 slash UFO cabal, crashed UFO. Confirmed he called Miller, CA, late June 97 and told that he, Miller, was right. There is such an organization in existence. Davis, what did you tell? Wilson, I found it where I looked. Who I talked to but did not name everyone. That's it. I show Miller letter to me, Davis, dated 42502. Please evaluate. Wilson laughs. Didn't tell Miller everything. Miller knows what I did in Pentagon Records Group, but but record group search, but no more. <laughs> Miller can make good educated guess on who contractors, on who in parentheses contractors has alien hardware. Do not pay Miller. Sounds hard up to pay for nice Florida home and private beach privilege. Laughs. Uh, Wilson, Miller can give good advice on which defense companies to look at. That's all he knows. Changes subject in parentheses there. Oak told about JA, doesn't trust JA, a liar. AP10, group meetings at BDM. So I'm trying to want, parse together who these are. JA... Group meetings at BDM. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, referencing, references Bloom's book. Talked about J.A. Bloom's book, his Oak's role there who attended. Oak briefed me on the whole BDM thing. Talked about RV program for 10 minutes. I know something of this RV. Reverse. Reverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Oak said I, well, 
EWD, so Eric Davis, was a team player, would keep mouth shut, no media connections, obey all restrictions, not in government, no clearances, but pedigree excellent. Professional, personal references, very excellent. So this Oak character is essentially referring Wilson to talk to Wilson, to Eric Davis for some reason. It sounds like they're like trying to offer him a job in a sense. Yeah. They're like... I don't know, something similar to that. So this is a letter to Eric Davis from from Miller. Yeah. Do you want me to read this part? Sure. <clears throat> Dear Eric, I must apologize to you and Hal for not getting back to you sooner. The fog of war current the fog of war, current business activity, and losing your new email address all contributed to the delay, which I regret. First, I must ask if you and or how would be interested in meeting Mr. Bob Beckworth in Tallahassee, Florida, the evening of May 30th. I think it's Beckwith. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Bob has been invited to meet with the head of the Florida Academy of Sciences <clears throat> and the director of the High Magnetic Field Laboratory for a roundtable discussion with his, Mr. Beckwith's, force model of the universe and his planned experiments in LTT, levit levitation, teleportation, and time travel, among other subjects. I believe that the meeting date is now firm, but that will be determined in a conference call Thursday, the 25th of April. Next. Dude, hang on. Yeah. By the way, what? LTT experiments from... Um, the High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Yeah. Levitation, teleportation, time travel. Force model of the universe. Yeah. Florida Academy of Sciences and the High Magnetic Field Laboratory. So these are all some interesting Oops. tidbits yeah. one could follow into and do some research on. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, let's come back to that. Next, let me respond to a few of your uh, your and Hal's previous questions. I would be willing to assist you and Hal with your ongoing research into UFO crash retrievals and the entities within the government or outside of it that are involved in that business with the following caveats. First, there must be no, absolutely no mention or association of my name with your work or investigation. I have absolutely nothing to gain from such association at this time and possibly much to lose. Second, I would charge you only to the act, for the actual time I spend in putting together materials, references, or contact lists for you to pursue. I would expect that time to be minimal since the initial information would not take long to put together, probably less than eight hours. My standard rate for such work is $180 per straight time hour. Third, nothing I would provide you would be classified from a national security perspective. Although I had, I have held a top secret clearance with access to special compartmented information or SCI. The other special clearances for other programs I currently do not work in the classified realm, nor do I hold these clearances. As I discussed with you, only by means of working on the current classified government contract and having the need to know, and thus requesting my clearances be reinstated by DOD, would I again work in the classified realm? So, yeah. Right. He's so he's saying he's not actively working in, in a program that requires these clearances, so he currently doesn't, doesn't have, have to have of the active... Right. And so because he doesn't have him, he can't talk about him, even if Eric also has those clearances or that he would need to be able. Yeah. Anyway. Now, all that said, and pending further discussion with you and Hal on your ultimate objectives for having such information, I would I could provide the following. One, particulars on a special team involved as a secondary mission with recovering crashed craft including but not limited to the previously classified F-117 stealth fighter. <clears throat> this team or its successors, its parent sponsoring entity, and its two key officers may provide some of the information that you seek. The name and last location of a senior officer 
who I believe to have, um, who I believe had firsthand knowledge, U.S. government alien reproduction vehicles AR or ARVs at Area 51 and associated locations. Three, the name and current location of a retired senior flag, uh, flag rank officer who I believe to be directly involved in government interaction with a significant UFO event on the East Coast of the U.S., and I believe has by as by virtue of his former leadership position, high military rank, and control of significant military forces, direct knowledge of USG involvement in this business. Number four, I can. He's saying he can. I give you a list of uh, civilian government contractors who, by virtue of their past and current highly classified work, current capabilities, their clearances, specialized personnel and geographic areas of concern most likely have current involvement and knowledge of usg work in the alien and derived technologies, derived, yeah. <laughs> crash, technologies crash landing and associated events if you have interest in any of the above please let me know finally i have a request i am trying to locate a company in las vegas nevada which some years ago manufactured a specialized disabling pepper spray for the military and law enforcement. The company was called One Mark Inc. at blah, 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 you know. Yeah, so he's looking for that person's CEO. I don't think that's <coughs> important. Yeah. But he, his name's on it, so oops. <laughs> uh, so this was written, best regards, Will Miller. So now we go back to uh, Wilson and Davis talking. By the way, I wasn't sure what flag rank officer meant, so I GPT that. It says, refers to a senior military officer at or above the rank that entitles them to fly, fly a flag representing their command. In most naives? Navies. In most navies, <clears throat> the term... <laughs> I can't... <laughs> uh, the term is typically used for officers at the rank of rear admiral or higher. While in armies and air forces, it may refer to officers at the rank of brigadier general or higher. So they're usually in charge of significant commands, often encompassing large units or entire operational theaters. The term flag originates from the practice of these officers flying their command flags on ships, bases, or vehicles. So flag rank is like when you get your own flag for your command. Yeah, it's like uh, it's it's it sounds like when back in the day when they were on ships, there was different like commands and they had different flags that literally flew. Right. To fly a flag representing their like command. You, right. So you get your <clears throat> own com command flag. Yeah, and you can get distributed between your who's in your command. So you're right. fl you're flying your own symbol for right. your leadership. Interesting. Um, cool. So <clears throat> let me also ask who is. Let me actually do this on the podcast. Yeah. We're talking about the Wilson Davis memo, and we're wondering who is Oak. That is referred to in the Dave, Wilson Davis memo multiple times. In the Wilson Davis memo, Oak is most likely a reference to Dr. Oak Shannon. Okay, Shannon was a physicist who worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory and had connections to various defense and intelligence programs. His name has been mentioned in the context of the Wilson Davis memo and discussions about alleged UAP-related programs. He may have been involved or had knowledge of the special access programs, SAPs, that the memo discusses. The Wilson Davis memo itself is a controversial document that allegedly describes a conversation between Admiral Thomas Wilson and Dr. Eric Davis regarding Wilson's attempts to access a deeply classified UFO reverse engineering program. OK, Shannon's role in the background could have been as someone knowledgeable in these matters, though the specifics of his involvement are unclear and speculative. OK. All right. I guess we're calling him OK. 
Okay. <laughs> Oak. Um, yeah, it's written as an OKE, but. So Wilson told Oak it's a bad time. Time no good to talk to me, Davis. Too busy. Said Oak, too difficult to contact anymore. Heard he was in and out of hospital. Extremely sensitive to stress. Heart sick. Bad news. Tried calling. Linda takes messages, but none returned. She doesn't want much on Oak's plate for fear. Doesn't say yes or no to request. I would think on it. Three years pass and retiring. Left DIA July 2002. Replaced by Admiral Jack B. <clears throat> Wilson came to test special site area to wrap up projects. He began in 98. Successor can't be bothered with right now um, for lack of time and knowledge. Did tour audit slash say goodbye to folks. Trip set up by NNSA, National Nuclear Security Agency. Rich and Doug, uh, you, EWD, know them. AFIO members. Told about how Las Vegas chapter needed guest speakers for chapter slash public venue. Raise money slash membership. Rich slash Doug talked about you, EWD. Phone from DC. Sent me copies of your NASA papers and other related wormholes your thing. Sent PACAF orders. USID Lockheed slides. Some reports I wrote for NASA. Uh, so Davis asks him when. Um. Mm. <clears throat> oh, September after <clears throat> Labor Day. Richard Doug told me I should talk to you about DIA careers, discuss history, mission, my career in that, etc. I knew better later when I saw your papers and stats they provided. Remembered Oak phone call and what he sent me slash what he said about you. Uh, Davis asks him, what did you do with it? Wilson had coffee or had office do background checks. Doug slash Rich offered to, but wanted my own data to be sure. AFIO vouched. AFIO people slash DC people now in Vegas vouched. So let's figure out what's the AI. AFIO. Former intelligence officers. Association for former intelligence officers. Hmm. Non governmental organization founded in 1975. Former CIA officer. Hmm. Hmm. Wilson gave deep, serious thought. Recalled Oaks. Call call in 99 oak really supported me ewd had good arguments uh davis asked what were they wilson um talking about davis said davis wouldn't talk to press to groups ufo or other such no media connections not talk to miller or greer or related folks no vested interest in publicity slash money slash fame slash notoriety, etc. So basically this Oak character is vouching for Davis, telling Wilson he can trust talking to him because Davis isn't going to go to the press with this info. Yeah, he's saying he, he'll keep it, keep it quiet. Mm-hmm. Calm. Uh, so Davis says, we spent time discussing my bank, my background, answered his questions on my Air Force, NASA, and related work interests, history with Air Force jobs, what I did, education, career choice, etc. No mention of NIDS, uh, that's National Institute for... Discovery Sciences. Discovery Sciences. Oak mentioned JA, me, NIDS in 99, but that's all that was said. Wilson, very furious, very angry about Miller. Facial expression tense, angry voice. 
violated personal and professional trust, especially among intelligence colleagues, Navy officers. There's Navy camaraderie among officers, brotherhood. Who's Miller? Who is Miller in terms of the Air uh, Wilson Davis memo? In the context of the Wilson Davis memo, Miller is likely a reference to Vice Admiral, Vice Admiral Michael J. Mike Miller, who served in the U.S. Navy. However, there is ambiguity about the precise identity of Miller in the memo, as it only refers to him by last name. It talks about Miller in an angry way, like he's some sort of whistleblower, or maybe talk to the press, because they also mention Greer, and I know Greer is one of these people that was poking around all this top secret info. That's, that's an interesting connection. In the Wilson Davis memo, the tone surrounding Miller being referenced in an irritated or angry way could suggest that he is seen as someone who perhaps overstepped, shared sensitive information, or inadvertently got too close to topics that were supposed to be tightly guarded. The fact that the memo also mentions Dr. Stephen Greer, a well-known... Okay, you're not being helpful. <laughs> She tries. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if the internet can answer this. Who is Miller in the Wilson Davis memo? Will Miller. Oh, Will Miller. He was that person. Was that Will Miller? He was the one, the one that he said he would refer to as Will Miller, but that it might not be who. Well, is this Miller who wrote this letter yeah. to Yeah, Earth? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, so he's pissed at Miller because Miller is like, he's like, hey, what information do you want me to put together for you? So sounds he's like the one that sounds like Miller is willing to like leak info to people, the right people anyway, for the right eight hour eight hours of work pay of one hundred eighty dollars an hour. Yeah. For eight, for eight hours to gather information. <laughs> hmm. uh, violated that and confidentiality. Davis says, how? Wilson, Miller told Greer their conversation. Who knows whom else he and Greer told? Davis, no. Miller told Ed Mitchell, who only told me in 99. That's interesting, yeah. So he's like, oh, you're not wrong. <laughs> Miller is blabbing, and that's how I know stuff, too. Yeah. At least that's what he's saying in his notes. It doesn't sound like he's saying this to Wilson, though. Uh, Wilson. Then he talks to Keen. Oh, yeah, Leslie Keen at the Boston Globe. Articles came out. I'm assuming that's Leslie Keen. She was also the one who was behind the uh, New York Times article later in 2017. Yeah, probably. Um, then he talks to Keen and Boston Globe articles came out. Not sure what he told Keen, but articles referenced me. Furious, got calls from all over. Davis, what was their nature? Sarcastic, stupid jokes, stupid comments, comments of surprise and derision that I would be talking to UFO nuts slash nutty UFO groups. Wilson who? Or Davis who? Wilson Co-workers, um, flag, flag officers. officers in Pentagon, lower staff, civilian, SES people, people in Intel community I work with got calls about articles and didn't like it. I'm taking a risk talking to you, but trust Oak's word and is and it is good with me. We should have met Oak together face to face, but present health problems prevent that. Too bad. So I'll take a risk with you. Uh, Rich and Doug vouch for you. Say your word is good with them. AFIO connection, important for trust. You um, know how to be a team player. Background check clear. No derogatory items found. Korean record good and AF trusts you. I'm running out of time, so let's get on with this. 
if you blow my trust, I'll deny meeting you, deny everything said, and won't meet with any more people without clearances to talk about this topic. Too risky because of a security violation just by mentioning it. Very tightly held info. Absurdly close held subject matter. Never seen anything like this program in black programs community. So basically this whole part of the letter that we've gone over so far, <clears throat> the Arthur Memo, is like, Wilson like vetting Davis. Yeah, right. Making sure that he has the type of background that he's looking interesting. Right. So it sounds like at this point he's ready. He's to like ready to talk about because he wants to be done stuff. and right. not be out there talking further. Right. It is. So <laughs> Davis says, "Okay, then what happened in April through June '97?" Wilson. After parting with Miller, weeks later, he thinks, I made calls, knocked on a few doors, talked to people, went on for 45 days, thereabouts, on and off. Suggestion came from Ward, General M. Ward, to go through the records, groups, files, like an index system in the OUSDAT, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology. Ran into Bill Perry in May 97 talked about this quietly he suggested the same thing they told me of a special projects record group not belonging to usual sap that's a special access program um a special subset of unacknowledged slash carve out slash waived programs not belonging belonging to usual sap divisions as organized in 94 by perry himself set apart from rest but buried slash covered in conventional saps so this uh, Bill Perry dude found out about these special access programs that are like buried within other special access programs. He's yeah, mentioning so they're this siphoning to, to funding Wilson. And, yeah. Right. By using the name of a different program. Mm -hmm. um, who was OUSDAT or USDAT? Uh, that was Paul Kaminsky. Talked to both Paul and Mike Kostinick, a brigadier general. Michael Kostinick questions Davis to Wilson, who says, in Paul's office, OUSDAT, director of special programs in OUSDAT, office of the undersecretary of defense for acquisition technology and logistics, as organized, reorganized by Perry in 94. Mike is director of SAPCO, Special Access Programs Coordination Office. Mike is a member and, and executive secretary of SAPOC, Special Access Programs Oversight Committee, in capacity with SAPCO director. Mike is member of senior review group. So when I, yeah, <laughs> it's a bunch of acronyms here. Yeah. <laughs> so this Mike Perry guy, or what Bill is it? Perry? Mike Costin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's director of SAPCO, okay? So I, I asked, uh, we can ask it again, GPT about SAPCO. Special Access Program Coordination Office. Basically, this is an office that um, is coordinating special access programs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's responsible for coordinating access to these programs, ensuring that only a select few individuals with proper clearance need to know and security protocols are aware of their existence or details. In cases like those described in Wilson Davis memo, SAFCO would be central to ensuring that these programs remain under the radar. Even from sen senior military officials who normally have high security clearances, such as Admiral Wilson. Mm. So this Mike Kostinick, in his association as director of SAPCO, has the ability to say who can and can't have access to these special access programs. But not only is he director of that, according to this, he's also a member and executive secretary to SAP AUC. This is the oversight committee for all the special access programs. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so he's got ultimate authority. 
Special Law Access Program Oversight Committee, high-level committee within the DOD that provides oversight for special access programs. It's to ensure that the SAPs are managed in accordance with the law, that they align with national security policies, and that their secrecy is maintained appropriately. So SAP OCK is the entity involved in giving people access. SAP Co. SAP Co is that. SAP OCK is the one that actually manages them. As far as like personnel and like what they're resources doing and, and right. So this might cost a character. Kind of oversees both. Seems to have like a pretty special position of visibility into all of these right. things. Right. But he's also a member of the senior review group. So let's ask about that. In context of the DOD. <clears throat> It's a high-level oversight body responsible for reviewing and managing special access programs. Operates as part of the broader special access program oversight structure alongside other entities like SAPOC. The senior review group specifically reviews and provides recommendations on special access programs to ensure they're compliant with the national security policy, legal standards, and resource allocation. It's composed of senior officials from various departments, such as DOD and intelligence community and other government agencies, depending on the program's nature. So, basically, <laughs> this might cost Nick. He, back to our X Files metaphor. Yeah. This is the guy, the, the smoking director. Man. Yeah, yeah. He's the guy who has like the back doors and all of the different programs and mm -hmm. review groups. And he just gets to sit back and say yes or no, but he's not necessarily having to like do any of the heavy lifting. Right. Interesting. Um, so yeah, Mike, a uh, pretty highly positioned person. So if anyone knows anything more, has done any more digging on, on this him, Michael yeah. Kostinik character, um, I would be super interested. Oh, we're past yeah, the break, let's take a break. So let's take another break. Yeah. We'll be back soon. Yeah. So as I was prepping for this, I kind of went on this whole rabbit hole myself and like just... The idea of like Davis talking to Wilson here and Wilson's like, yeah, I'm trying to find info on this stuff and I keep running into these, you know, barriers oh, and I'm above this stuff trying to figure out what's going on, but they won't let me know. Mm. But we yeah, haven't gotten have that far yet. So anyway, doors. it's uh, interesting. We'll so right enjoy this is TJ Soul for Sale. Notion personality. Given the way things are going, it would be a given if it didn't stop unraveling. Well, I have pity thoughts for believing. Well, hell, I pity thoughts of my own. own. It wouldn't be a given if it were given to me, but those are. Faults of my own Well, I always wanted to speak so smoothly Like I was born with a tongue of glass But I gave away the language given to me Now it's just a story of my past I heard of only men to admit to their fears But sadly enough I'm nothing but 
not a boy with a soul for sin. Well, I never think to stick my toes into cold water. Cause I imagine those depths to swallow me whole And I always listen to the lessons from my father But I fail to make his morals my own Cause I never thought to be scared of anything But everything well now it scares the shit out of me Cause I always wanted to be the one who was strong-headed But I realized Strongholds are weak Well, I would be a man To admit to my fails Well, sadly enough I'm nothing but a boy With a soul for sin Did a little more digging, found an interesting uh, Reddit post. I did some searching on this uh, Michael Kostelnik and uh, found a Reddit post where someone had put together um, a list of people that he was pretty sure were all involved in some sort of administrative um, authority over the UFO special access programs. Um, and Which to remember, like these are pretty well like understood now because right. of all these whistleblowers. So he's got Michael Kostelnik on that list. I thought it was a pretty interesting uh, Reddit post. So I'll link it here for you guys to uh, read further on it. If you're interested. Who was that? The number one person? It was, he was number two on the <clears throat> well, list. Well, it was just, they, did they it, not was, let it was in chronological order. Okay. And it seemed like it, what the list was doing was covering people who were in charge of a particular post oh, that the person was associating with the UFO field. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. And Kostelnik was one of those I was guys. Thinking they, were, they were putting it in like number one was like the top, you know, dog. But yeah. then you told me the, the dates. Um, but I also searched up Kostelnik and found his link on Air Force.af.mil, the Air Force's website. And they have a long list here of his assignments. And I just want to pick a few of these out. Um, so he was part of... He was the aircraft commander earlier in his career. Um, test forces. Um, program director for F-16 systems. Yeah, a little further down. He's got, then he's got the special programs office of undersecretary of defense for acquisition and technology. Right. So eventually he starts getting these postings at like Wright Patterson. So from 89 to 91, he's deputy program director of the F-16 systems based out of Wright Patterson. Um, 91 to 92, um, aeronautical systems division, Wright Patterson. 93, Aircraft Systems Program Office, Aeronautical Systems Center, Wright Patterson. Um, then he moves to Robbins Air Force Base, uh, but Down then the he becomes in 94, 95, Director of Special Programs Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology and Executive Sec Secretary. Special Access Program Oversight Committee, Office of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, then he goes back to Wright-Patterson, 
Um, and then he spent some time at Eglin Air Force Base, which I was just talking to Drew about. Um, I think Y Files does a video on that, but like if you Google, there's there's like a whole there's a more modern like UFO whistleblower that's coming out, um, and I don't know how confirmed any of it is, but about Eglin Air Force Base and base and like claiming that it is uh, like it's got this big underground component comp according to this dude, and that it is essentially the base that watches all craft coming to and from earth so like they're the ones watching the ufos coming and going yeah. so um, they know and they may have some hand in their coming and going yeah so according to this like you know claimed whistleblower um there's a bunch of weird alien shit going on at eglin so it's interesting mm -hmm. that you know of the places like people talk about UFO stuff going down and the reverse engineering stuff like Wright Patterson is on that list. Eglin. Then he was involved in the special access program and then he was involved in Eglin. Like he seems pretty well positioned to have definitely been involved in this stuff. So yeah. I'll leave a link to some of this stuff. Let me know if you guys have done any more digging on this guy. And he's retired, right? He's in his 70s, you said? Yeah, he's born in 1950, so he'd be 74 right now. Um, but maybe he's working in the private sector now. Yeah, still doing... If he's doing anything. Doing some sort of moonlighting. Um, I would hope. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're a type of person who has that sort of career, you don't really want to retire. But or you just never really do. Like I would your hope life you is like built at around least it. Earn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I think it's time. We need to get this stuff out, Michael Kostelnik. Yeah. Um. Cool. So let's keep going here. Um. So. Says TW was deputy director, DIA slash assistant joint chief of staff, J2 at time. Boss was director, DIA general, Patrick Hughes. Wilson, so found the unusual record group. Read the index abstracts. Uh, Davis, budget info. Wilson, no budget info. That is kept in separate records for audit purposes. A security budget record is copied into a folder for the program. I talked to Mike, who said it was two to three times the program budget, but there were times when it went as high as six to seven times the core budget. Thought it was absurdly high, said Perry wanted an investigation on that, but was told to drop it. So Wilson is going in there saying... Like, hey, whatever these special access programs you guys got going on there, spending a lot of money. <laughs> a ton of money. And Out of, like, the core budget, too. Like, six to seven times the core budget. And then the program itself, two to three times the program budget. Mm-hmm. And this Mike character is telling him to drop it. Yeah. Drop it as far as the investigation goes. Yeah. Uh, Davis, who told him that? Wilson, he didn't want to answer my question on that. Said I could find out something from Judy Daly. Uh, and then there's a sub note here. It says Judith Daly, Assistant Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Advanced Development. How's that? Okay. How's that? How's that? Wilson, she said by phone call that secretary and other program budget records were being revamped and relocated to their own records group. Security budgets were sometimes cumulative and not annual numbers. Easy to see how misunderstanding occurs when compared to annual pro program budget figures six to seven times could be two to five years cumulative total. There have been errors in way security budgets reported. Interesting. That's a interesting way that they would budget cumulative. Yeah. So they like take like a chunk of time and then they just 
say we need this much money for roughly this min- amount of time and we may or may not use that quicker. Right, and they're keeping that budget cumulatively rather than tracking it on a year-by-year basis. So if it gets audited, that you might get that cumulative figure and have like a m- misrepresentation of how much it's actually spending per year if you're right. assuming it's a yearly budget. Right, okay. Uh, Wilson... <laughs> Perry ordered all these issues to be recognized and straightened out to improve audit transparency. Davis, change subject. So what SAP compartment did you find in? Wilson, core secret, won't say. Davis, code name? Wilson, again, won't say, core secret. Davis, who was the project contractor or USG agency that runs program? Wilson, an aerospace technology contractor, one of the top ones in the U.S. Davis, who? Wilson, core secret, can't tell. Is that just is like, <laughs> that's why the way he doesn't answer certain questions? Right. But there's only so many aerospace technology contractors. Yeah, especially one of the top ones in the U.S. So yeah. it's going to be like Boeing or Lockheed, Lockheed probably a Lockheed. Um, one of these, you know, Raytheon, Skunk something works. like that. Yeah. Um, Davis, defense contractor. Wilson, yes, the best of them. Davis, intelligence too. Wilson, in their corporate portfolio. Davis, give a hint. Wilson, sorry, no. Davis, what happened when you found contractor? Wilson, I made several calls end of May 97. First to Paul, Mike, and Perry to confirm I had right contractor and program manager to talk to. Davis, they confirm? Wilson, yes. Davis, then, question. (laughs) Wilson, end of May 97, made three calls to the program manager. One of them conference call with security director and corporate attorney. Confusion as on their part as to why I was looking for them and what I wanted from them or wanted to know about. Very testy tone from all of them. Davis, what do you mean? Wilson, they were agitated about my calling, surprised by my call. Davis, what you asked them? <laughs> Question mark? Question mark? Wilson, what, or, oh, what you asked them? Oh, that oh, makes more sense. That makes more sense. Wilson, <laughs> he missed a comma there. Yeah, yeah. I don't <laughs> think there's much of actual punctuation in this. Right. Wilson, yes. Davis, what was that? What words? Wilson, I told I read their program record in Austat Special Program Records Group and wanted to know about their crash UFO program. What role in that was what they had, et cetera. Also asked if they heard of MJ-12 or some such organization code relating to crash slash UFO recovered craft. Davis, reaction on phone to that? Wilson, yes. Asked who I talked to before I called them, so I told them and they weren't happy with that answer. Davis, you meant about Perry, Paul, et cetera? Wilson, oh no, I didn't tell them I talked to those guys. Davis, whom else you talked to? Question mark. Wilson, they were the other program managers I called. Davis, you didn't mention that before. Wilson, I thought I said something. Davis, who were they? Wilson, three programs who said they weren't what slash who I was looking for. Four programs referred me back to the present threesome. So basically, he had gone looking at these other programs, looking for the UFO Mm -hmm. people, and those programs said that they weren't what he was looking for, but referred him back to these people. Right. Davis, why the latter? Wilson, because they were part of it in different compartments, placed in different layers of the compartments pyramid, split up to do different things or parts of it. They're all in the same records group, but their connection to each other is not obvious. Typical thing, but unusual in records. Davis, what then? I told Threesome I wanted formal briefing, tour, etc. 
was exploiting my re regulatory authority as deputy director, DIA slash ass assistant joint chief of staff, J2. Told them my not being briefed was oversight they needed to correct. I demanded. So he's telling them, he's like, yo, I'm your fucking bosses, bitch. <laughs> like, like how he's this is this is an error that you're not reporting your program to me. Yeah. And the fact that you're like so callous and like just saying or just not cooperating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I was just referencing him as the threesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wilson, they needed to discuss this, his demand, so hung up. Got called two days later, and they said they don't want to talk on the phone and arrange for face-to-face -face meeting at their facility. Davis, did you go? Wilson, yes. Ten days later, mid-June or so, flew out there. Met in their conference room in their secure vault. Three of them show up. Davis, three guys with whom you had telcon? Wilson, yes, same three. Security director, NSA retired, a CI expert. A program director, corporate attorney, called themselves the watch committee or gatekeepers. It's mm. interesting. The watch committee, I like that. That could yeah. be a good title for a movie. Or like a band name. Or just like a documentary on like all of this stuff coming out years later. Or an episode title, The Watch Committee. Yep, there we go. <laughs> Davis, why that phrase, name, Wilson? I asked, they said they were formed out of necessity to protect themselves after a near disaster in the past almost blew their cover. Something to do with an agreement that was reached with a couple of Pentagon SESs overseeing SAPs in those days. We're vague about when that was. What is Pentagon SESs? Senior Executive Service Personnel. Hmm. So there's people who do all the, like, the actual like work? Yeah, so essentially at some point in the past, there were some Pentagon senior executives who found them and almost blew their cover. And so since then, they put together this watch committee to That's be great. the ones to help maintain the distance. Interesting. Um, Davis, what was this? Wilson, let me finish. They said years ago in past, an audit investigation led to them, and it wasn't supposed to, nearly outed, a battle, a nasty back and forth between them and investigator and his Pentagon chief ensued, like a tug of war for program transparency. They told me money was the issue. Their hiding out became their other issue. Some kind of threat was leveled to blow the lid off them, so they backed down and let the investigator in to complete his job. They worked very hard to keep the program hidden. Davis, what happened with that? Wilson, he was officially briefed, given tour, shown their program. Davis, what did they show him? A craft or hardware they said was alien or from a UFO? Wilson, they didn't say more about that. Said after a couple, or said after that episode, a formal agreement was struck with Pentagon people, SAPOC, to prevent this in the future. Didn't want to repeat. Special criteria were established in agreement. A special circumstance that must, must meet rigorous access criteria set by contractor committee. No USG personnel are to gain access unless they meet criteria to be administered by contractor committee, program director, attorney, security director, irregardless of the tickets and position USG personnel possessed. Literally their way or the highway. So it's essentially saying they reached an agreement with the SAPOC um, of the Pentagon, who were the mm -hmm. ones that are overseeing these special access programs. And they said, the agreement was 
in the future, no matter what level of access you have, no matter what position you are in the government, no matter what security tickets, the tickets are like these like individual security clearances for mm -hmm. compartmentized comp for compartmented access programs. Yeah. No matter what tickets you have, no matter what level of clearance, no matter your seniority, nothing. We just, we, decide we decide based on our if own you get criteria. access, right? Which is crazy. Yeah, especially with such information. <laughs> like, right. I mean, unless that's exactly what the plan to bury it so far deep and make it so that they have the easiest way to deny access to the information even from people who would otherwise have full access to that information mm -hmm. so yeah it's buried deep <laughs> at least so, all the real real evidence and the real information right this is why like even as a president you may not even be able exactly. to get access like you might get some peripheral stuff because you could tell one of your generals to go ask and the generals could go hunt it down and then be rejected access by these people yeah. Yep. Yeah, you would literally need to be one of the people and be president right. that are within it. And they're um, and it seems like they're likely, you know, groomed or, you know, as far as like continuing I'm sure it's that. Very selective. Very as selective. Who has access, access. Or it's just a treasure trove and the people who are actually keeping it secret don't even know. Yeah. And it's like there's some sort of backdoor that they don't even need to know about what they're protecting. They just protect it. And the people who actually need to know have mm -hmm. the access, whatever they want. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. Special criteria were established in agreement. So, like, there is criteria, but it's super rigorous. A special criteria, circumstance. And that you means can't just. Rigorous access criteria set by a contractor. Can do, can we, and, and that's the thing is the. Like, we're talking about a, a contractor. Mm -hmm. Like, the people who are actually, like, we're talking about the top contractor, military contractor in the U.S. These are not people who have to follow. Like the same rules that the government has to follow. Right. They are given this information because of that reason. And it's it's not to say that the high level government people are not also the ones who have the access and to those companies or are the ones working right. on those companies. Because that happens all the time where you see government employees or and if it is black then these people are probably getting a paycheck and we'll never know their names i mean this is all part of what lou is complaining about with mm -hmm. all of this is that like like even if this is all set up for whatever security reasons like it's not accountable to anyone in the government or anyone who's elected like at what point do the american people have a right to know because it seems like it's far past time and take a take a quick break. Oh yeah, we are ready for one anyway. So, I'll we will be right back.
Welcome back. Sorry for that quick outro there on the last one, but well, we had one some... of the boys woke up abruptly. Yeah. He had a <laughs> nightmare or something. Fire drill nightmare? Yeah, he doesn't like the fire drills at school. <laughs> Poor kiddo. That's scary. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, waking up to loud noises in your dream. Not cool. No. All right, so let's get back into it. So Wilson was talking about the uh, criteria, the criteria. Yeah, for right. getting access to the program. So Davis asks, uh, what are the criteria? Wilson says, I asked for that and they refused to give the answer. I was mad. Implication is now to me. They operate without official oversight or any justification. Politically dangerous place to be. Threesome concerned with who Wilson had talked to at Pentagon or elsewhere by phone, fax, email, wanted accounting of conversations, concerned about new exposure. Purpose of meeting was to tell me this. Davis, what? Wilson, that they weren't going to let me in the door. Davis, why? Wilson, they said my tickets were all confirmed and valid, but I was not on the bigot list. My tickets alone were not enough. I didn't meet the special criteria, so need to know authorization was not being granted. Went back and forth with them over these points, primarily with security director and attorney. Argued more. They wouldn't accept my arguments that they fell under my statutory oversight and regulatory authority as deputy director DIA under purview for my right to have need to know oversight audit justification issues etc cetera, etc cetera. regulatory and statutory authority as deputy director dia not relevant or pertinent to nature of their program then they pulled out their bigot list to convince me otherwise several pages long dated 1990 updated 1993 hmm. davis who was on it recognized names wilson that is core secret willing to say that most were program employees names and titles job titles civilians didn't recognize any military personnel could be there davis any politicians wilson no no white house names no president no congressional people no congressional staffers. Davis, any Clinton or Bush senior administrators? Wilson, no. A handful of names were Pentagon individuals I recognized. Few from, few from Ausdat, one from another department, another from NSC, who is Pentagon SES employee, National Security Council. I think that's... Yeah. Uh, senior executive. One of the senior executive officers, yeah. yeah. Um, program manager said they were not any weapons program, not any intelligence program, not any special ops or logistics program. Doesn't fit these categories. I asked what they were then. Loud groan from program manager. Security director and attorney say, it's okay to say it. Davis, say what? Wilson, they were a, a reverse engineering program. Something recovered years ago in the past. Technological hardware was recovered. So I thought they meant recovered Soviet slash Chinese, etc. hardware and reverse engineer it. Like a missile or Intel platform or aircraft actually came to meeting expecting to find a sensitive foreign collection and reverse engineering operation thought ufos was used as a cover for that so i said that and they said they weren't that either they had program manager talking at this point a craft an intact craft they believe could fly space air water dimensions was it from overseas or not said no could not be not possible why i asked where did it come from program manager 
said they didn't know where it was from. They had some ideas on this. It was technology that was not of this earth, not made by man, not by human hands. Said, we're trying to understand and exploit technology. The program was going on for years and years with very slow progress, agonizingly sn- slow with little or no success painful lack of collaboration to get help from outside community of experts and facilities to assist effort must remain isolated and use own facilities and cleared personnel tough environments to work about four to eight hundred bigot list count workers varying in number with funding or personnel changes miller questions asked Roswell, Kraft, Bodies, Autopsy, Holloman, AFB, Landy, MJ-12 and Leak Docks, Zamora and Bent Waters, etc. They were mum. Declined to discuss these. Wilson threatened to go to Sapoc to complain, gain access to their program. They said, go ahead and do what you must. I was angry be- because they defied my authority to be read in with good logical reason, wouldn't budge. Their tone was very testy, terse throughout the conversation. Hmm. Davis, what was the outcome? Wilson, meeting broke up and I returned to Washington. Davis, what about Corso? Wilson, Greer talked about Corso on April 9th. Miller showed me book during two hour private conversation didn't have time to read it though. Didn't buy a copy. Didn't bring Corso up at meeting. But comparing Corso's story to what I learned at meeting is more than enough to believe Corso told truth about seeing alien hardware, etc. Davis, did you complain to Sapoc? Wait, before we go there, who's this Corso? Yeah. Greer even talked about him. Uh, likely is Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso, controversial figure who gained attention for his claims about U.S. government involvement with extraterrestrial technology, best known for his book The Day After Roswell, which was co-authored with William J. Burns, published in 1997. So it says he claims that there was some secret effort to reverse engineer technology recovered from the 1947 Roswell qu- crash and that the U.S. Army's Foreign Technology Division in the 1960s oversaw the distribution of alien technology to American defense contractors. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he's one of these early whistleblowers, really. Interesting. That's a good book to put on the list, then. Sure. Interesting. Okay. Did you, Davis, did you complain to Sapoc? Uh, Wilson, yes. Called the subgroup members, senior review group, group members, to a meeting at Pentagon. Told them what happened at meeting. They responded that they would sustain the contractor on their access denial. So I ended up arguing with them a while. Broke up in 20 minutes and they would meet me in two to three days. Got the call two days later, near end of June, and met again with senior review group members. Davis, when? Wilson, before last week of June, 97. They told me that they were sustaining the contractor, that I was to immediately drop the matter and let it go, forget about it, as I did not have purview over their project. It didn't fall within my oversight, etc., I became very angry, started yelling when should have kept my mouth shut. Davis, Miller and Greer said you nearly got busted. Wilson, close to that, told Miller, senior review group chairman, that if I didn't follow their suggestion that I, um, that I would not see director DIA promotion um, get early retirement, lose one or two stars along the way. Really incredibly angry, upset over this, livid. Why such a big deal over this considering the position of trust I have in the Pentagon? I do have relevant regulatory slash statutory authority over their program. 
That's my position. Davis, is it because funding comes from you or through you or director DIA? Wilson, core secret, can't answer. Mm -hmm. Davis, back to the bigot list. Can you describe type of people? Wilson, corporate types, scientists and technicians, engineers, scientists, managers, etc. Davis, any military organizations you recognized? Wilson, none, just Ausdat people and two on SAPOC, one other Pentagon office. In December 97, Paul was um, out as Ausdat left government. So was Mike K, replaced too. Yeah, I want to know who they're. They yeah. got replaced? So yeah. that's that Mike K we were talking about. So he was gone in 97. Right. And then these people took over. Right. By whom? Uh, Jacques Gansler was new U.S. DAT, started December 97. Mike K was replaced by Brigadier General M. Ward Air Force. Mm. Davis, were Paul K and Mike K and Jacques Gansler and General Ward the ones on the bigot list you recognized? Wilson won't answer that. That's a yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wilson talked to Gansler in January 98 about my June 97 meetings. He was briefed by someone, surprised me. Davis, what did he say? Wilson, UFOs are real. So-called alien abductions, not real. Gansler said this. What else? Wilson, told to drop the matter. No more, no more discussion about it. Davis, willing to talk to Hal Putoff and Kit Green, discuss who they are in RV program history. Wilson, not familiar with names, heard about RV program in 1990. Maybe slash maybe not for how would think about it. No response on Kit Green. Prefers never to talk to anyone else about this again. Risks exposure. Better to stop talking. Cut it off here. Wilson, what will you do with this? Asking D Davis that. Davis, keep it for private slash personal research, data collection to track down the story and ascertain signal slash noise in media and from government sources. We'll keep mouth shut, et cetera, et cetera. Told Wilson about Mary Elizabeth Elliott TRW story, Inigo's, Ingo's story, and 1974. Ingo's one? Yeah, I think so. Who's Mary Elizabeth Elliott? <laughs> I think she's probably another one of them. The major defense and aerospace company. Okay. Interesting. So she's uh, one of the corporate types. Yeah. Okay. Ingo What's her story, though? That's what I want to know. Right. Uh, reportedly shared some of her experiences with attorney Jeff W. Griffith. And some believe she had firsthand knowledge of alien technology or, or even <coughs> intact craft housed at TRW facilities. Or she's a hybrid. Speculation also surrounds her potential <coughs> psychic abilities as her story has been grounded or grouped with figures like Ingo Swan, a well-known remote viewer, which suggests a deeper connection between Elliot's knowledge and highly classified UAP projects. She's a hybrid. <laughs> There are also suggestions that she planned to keep certain information secret till her deathbed, fueling speculation about what she may have witnessed or known. However, concrete evidence about her role or testimony is sparse, adding to the air of mystery surrounding her. Is she still around? Um, Mary Elizabeth Elliot. Let's see. 19, died 1976. No, this is a plant oh, yeah, pathologist, mycologist. Unless the ETs are freaking <laughs> mycologists. It's just mushrooms, spores. That's where all sentience comes from. She's going to be a ghost. Yeah, I don't see anything about her. We'll have to dig it. Oh, there you go. 
Oh, 2015. And one right below that, too, references the story. All right. Oh, that's Reddit. Another Reddit post. This one, the gospelcoalition.org has... 2015. Is this the one? No, this is definitely just like Unless she's part of the Collins elite. <laughs> We're making all these connections <laughs> to this one lady. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Let's finish this up. Yeah, um, I think it's about it over there. Yeah, right? we're on the last page anyway. Um, so, yeah, he told Wilson about Mary Elizabeth Elliott, TRW <coughs> story, Ingo mm-hmm. story, and 1974 Arver woman who went to... Arver women? Woman. RVer woman. Because they keep who, referencing this RV thing. Who went to Wright Patterson Air Force Base trying to make connection. Oh, interesting. Wilson, feedback. Mary Elliott sounds like real deal based on her info and behavior with Attorney General or Jeffrey W. Griffith. Probably will only come clean, come totally clean on her deathbed 30 years from now. Don't know about Ingo, Ink Axelrod, or RV or woman at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Doesn't have info on their stories from sources. Ask for Corso material, we'll send. Um, Davis, no, Wilson asked for a briefing book on my work, NASA and Air Force related. Send other papers if I want to. Give an office address to in, in D.C. to mail. Will retire retire to Midwest and close office in 2003. That's the end of the memo. That's And he was referring to Wilson, right? He, right. He closes up shop in 2003? Right. Interesting stuff, yeah, I'm glad huh? we went through that, yeah. So yeah, I wanted to go through that before I finish reading the, okay. this last bit that uh, Lou has to say about it. So he brings up the Wilson memo in connection to talking about Davis being one of the graybeards that's reading him right. into the program, right? Right. Um, so he says when um, Mitchell died, his safe was opened, the memo was found and circulated publicly. That's how the memo leaked. So the Wilson... Davis memo created a sensation for good reason. Vice Admiral Wilson, curious about certain black program line items in the budgets that crossed his desk, began asking questions. He got a meeting with representatives of a certain aerospace corporation and their attorney. Wilson put his cards on the table. Just what were they doing with this specific line item? He discovered that the contractor was part of an extremely secret program focused on retrieving and reverse engineering crashed advanced vehicles of unknown origin and not made by humans. I learned the larger program is referred to as the legacy program and involves various elements of the U.S. government and U.S. defense contractors. The contractors took the wreckage into their possession and the security enveloping these projects was beyond top secret. In fact, the contractor's attorney brashly informed the admiral that if he continued to ask questions, it could get him fired and cause him to lose his pension. The admiral backed down. He confided the details of the encounter to Davis and never spoke of it again, even after the memo leaked. The memo is terrifying on many levels. The American taxpayer has been footing the bill for these retrievals and the subsequent analysis and reverse engineering efforts, but with no proper congressional oversight. Even worse, people in the government programs die while corporations endure. Long after anyone in the government with knowledge of the program retires or dies, these materials remain in the vaults of these corporations and in a sense become private property. Imagine the value of the objects in the custody of these companies and what sort of advancements they have been benefiting from off the back of this. Imagine, too, that the level of bureaucracy that would permit a U.S. admiral to be threatened by a corporation for asking questions related to his own budget and work he legally has oversight of on behalf of the American people. Yeah, kidding. It's pretty scary stuff. 
Right. I mean, n- not to mention the not even just with the UFO stuff, just the fact that these corporations, because of the potential for what this material that they may have means and has the power of doing, mm-hmm. and at one point maybe there was some direct oversight, but over the over the decades, this this oversight has fallen off, and they have the power to decide who gets to see well, it. And they and still it, and they still have this material in their uh-huh. possession. They're still doing reverse engineering. They're still trying to pull info out of it. So now they're in a b- better position of knowledge over the government that originally gave them access to do it. Right. Yep. Yeah, so they know they have no direct. Uh, the government maybe at one point had the ability to like oversee what was actually going on there, but maybe at this point they're well. It sounds like way way past that. It sounds like people like that Mike. Uh, what's his name that we Mike were K. looking into? Yeah, um, people like him who run the um, special access program, um, and like it sounds like there are a couple people there in those positions that have the ability to like declassify this or read people in right right? or at least like override their refusal to let someone be read in right right. and so those are a couple key people they have in the government they have to keep involved but that's it as as long as those people won't give you access even an admiral and these people that they're reporting to in the in the in the background are people that hold other positions that allow for the funding to continue Mm -hmm. without any sort of actual auditing of what's actually being spent and where it's being spent and right and they can they can maintain the air of we don't know we have no idea what this is these, you know, because these companies are the ones who are actually doing and flying and testing if they are actually have flyable ones. Um, if they were fully I mean, reverse engineered or if they're just taking well, and technology what kind of and made their own. What blank do they have? Like how, like how much how much of a unfair competitive advantage do they have in the economy at large Absolutely. when they can spin off these reverse engineered technologies into Create new the corporations? that they own the patents for that end up like changing the world, right? And they have a monopoly on it. Right. So it's a uh, government of a we are funding the, one of the largest monopolies because then they're able to create the product that they sell. And there's for a long time and I don't know how much I buy into this or at least I haven't done the work to see if the people who perpetrate these conspiracies have any argument or not but like right, i've heard right. the claims that like microchips and certain things have actually come out of these reverse engineering yeah. um programs yeah and i don't know the, i mean there's very likely not truth to that but i don't know well i mean just j- let's just think so 1945 to get the roswell crash Maybe one of the first, if not the first, crash retrieval. Right. At that and time, the computers program, exist, but they're all these big uh, vacuum tubes with like giant, like computer fed, like punch cards. Like right. it's very primitive at the time. Yeah. And, and not too long after that, literally less than 30 years or about 30 years later, we go to the moon, a little over 30 years. From Roswell. Wait, um, no, twenty years. When do we got sixty nine, right? Yeah. So, like you could say, like obviously the technology would be better now, at least what they can get out of it. But mm-hmm. like that would make like having something so drastic as like leaving the planet, yeah. going to I mean, going to the moon, not leaving the. Really, you're just going into space. But anyway, and then losing that somehow, or at least not having the funding, so you're not getting the resources from the companies, or there's just a lot of that going on in the background that we don't know about as far as like actual space travel going on. NASA losing its funding after the Apollo program? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did the shuttle stuff, but that was all just International Space Station 
Right. It was and, all low Earth orbit stuff. Yeah. Um, let me finish this section here. Okay. Uh, when I first heard about this, I was reminded of Dwight Eisenhower's famous farewell speech. A few days before he left the Oval Office in 1961, after half a century in service for the country, he thoughtfully warned the public, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex, the potential for disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. The Wilson Davis mem memo was another reminder of the power of American military defense contractors that were grandfathered into the efforts to recover and reverse engineer crashed or otherwise recovered UAP ostensibly giving them incredible advantages over their comp competitors and the rest of humanity. These companies truly have more power than the government officials who are supposed to be overseeing them. In reality, these officials get no oversight or awareness at all. Defense contractors iron lock on UA UAP materials supersedes every kind of normal or routine security protocol in the government. Yep. Yeah, that's crazy stuff. And yeah. a little teaser on like where the like legal aspects of all this go later on when he starts covering all the, the bills that are being talked about. And one of the big provisions that actually got redacted out of the last um, um, National Defense Authorization Act um, was the provision of of giving the government the ability to um, claim imminent domain on all these materials and basically mm. repatriate it into government possession. That's something that they're trying to work on? That's something that got kicked out of the last National Defense oh, Authorization Bill. Um, but that would be huge. That's something Lou is still fighting to get in there. <clears throat> yeah, that would be huge. Yeah. I mean, at least with the government... We can maybe have a chance. Right. At least there's like some people in there who have beliefs that American people have a right to yeah. know. Yeah. At least we have like a FOIA maybe, for 50 years down the line. Right, right, like right, at least right. there are some sort at least of there's mechanisms. A at least there's a chance. Not that it's great, mm -hmm. but at least but, there's hey. something. And at least Congress would have, at least certain people within Congress would have an ability to see some we'd, stuff. We'd, so. we'd hear more and we'd know more. Yeah, for at sure. least there's a better chance of like progress being made. Versus these like super secret defense contractors having that full control. So the real power lies. Yeah. Well, hey, <clears throat> thanks for hanging with us <clears throat> on this latest episode. Um, if you liked the episode, you can find all of our episodes on any of the podcast platforms. Obviously, you're listening here. Um, but if you want to listen or find any of the materials from the um, shows, like the links and any of the, like the, the show Davis notes. Like the memo. Yeah, we'll have all that linked. If you want to watch the Bashar video live, you can go to YouTube. If you want to see it inside the content, you can go to YouTube or Rumble for that content. Um, yeah, and we want anybody who wants to get involved in, in the community um, give us a comment or hit us up at host at dualitycheck.net. That's our email directed yeah. to us. Let us know what are we missing out of this story. What other uh, interesting uh, tidbits connect to all this stuff that we haven't uh, put together yet. Appreciate it, y'all. We'll see you next time. Adios. Adios.